The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. This recitation is sort of um, on that spec is supposedly associated with reactive oxygen species, so we haven't gotten there yet. So, which happens all the time in this course because we can't describe all the techniques as we go along because we don't have enough time. So, what I'm going to do is just give you sort of a two second overview of what you need to think about um, to put the paper you read into the big picture. I don't think the paper. The paper also explains it, and um, this week um, we're going to focus on the mass spec paper, uh, which is mostly sort of um, trying to figure out the technology. And that the next week is focused on the biology. Um, and so the major unsolved problem. So everybody and his brother is using mass spectrometry as a tool now. It's using a revolution and mass spectrometry, you know, um, assistant professors have mass spectrometers in the lab that certainly didn't exist five years ago. Um, the instrumentation is cheaper. Um, they, the mass spectrometric methods have um, just really taken off. I mean, and people didn't even know who mass spectrometrists were, but they're starting to win major prizes because it's revolutionized um, what we can do. I mean, I was talking to somebody um, yesterday and they just got a, um, a mass on a protein that's 3.3 million. How do you get a protein into the gas phase that's 3.3 million, right? I mean, doesn't that sort of blow your mind? <laughs> anyhow, anyhow, it's sort of, there's been a revolution. Okay, and we're gonna be looking at, this is module um, seven, which is on reactive oxygen species. And um, we've been talking about the question of homeostasis. Um, and so one of the things that with these reactive oxygen species is they are used by us to kill bacteria or viruses or parasites. But now in the last five years or so, everybody's focusing on the fact that you have these reactive oxygen species that play a key role um, in signaling, okay? Um, which is everywhere and signaling the signaling process we're going to be looking at. Um, so next time, and is alluded to in this particular paper, is um, epidermal growth factor receptor and epidermal growth factor. And there are hundreds of these um, proteins that have receptors that are involved in growth and epidermal growth factor. The receptor are the targets um, of successful um, cancer therapeutics. So everybody's interested in what happens up here, what happens down in here, how do you control all of that? Um, and people are studying this. So um, we've already seen cysteine is unique. Um, and if you have a reactive oxygen species, and we'll see um, that the reactive oxygen species we'll be looking at, we're going to be looking at a number is actually superoxide. So that's one electron induced oxygen which in the presence of protons can rapidly disproportionate to give oxygen gas and hydrogen peroxide. Um, and hydrogen peroxide um, can react with cysteines to form sulfenic acids, which is the subject of the paper you had to read. Okay. Um, and so the question is, how prevalent is this? And the question is, is this important and interesting in terms of regulation um, inside the cell? And so the key issue is, I mean, even cysteines aren't all that stable. You know, if you have proteins with cysteines and you let it sit around for a long time, you could, well, in the proteins concentrated, you can form disulfides. It's not a straightforward reaction, but you can form disulfides. Um, the question is, if you had hydrogen peroxide inside the cell, which you do, can you form sulfenic acids, and do they have a consequence um, biologically? Okay, and that's the question we're going to address next time. And so the issue is, this is unstable. Okay. 
So if you want to develop a method to look for this species and you start cracking open cells and you start working it up, what happens is this falls apart and reacts and gets destroyed. And an, an example of this is the area of DNA um, therapeutic and DNA drug interactions, therapeutics that interact with DNA for decades. You see lesions on your DNA, right? How do you determine what the lesions are? Mass spec has been a major method to look at that. Almost all the lesions in the early days were complete artifacts of the analytical chemistry to work them up. They had to get them into some form that you could stabilize the lesion and then analyze it. And what was happening, because they weren't careful enough and quantitative enough, they changed it into something else. Um, and so you, the data in the early days was all completely misinterpreted. So the issue in this paper is that other people had developed this, and Carol has, Kate Carroll has taken this on. Um, can we have a way of derivatizing this eventually inside the cell? Because if you disrupt, um, if you disrupt this um, by cracking open the cells and trying to purify things, it undergoes further reaction. And what this can undergo further reaction to is SO2 minus, so chronic acids, or SO3 minus. Sulfinic acids and sulfonic acids, okay? And it turns out this reaction is also reversible with hydrogen peroxide. A lot of people are looking at that. And this one, to this stage, is irreversible. Anyhow, so the question is, can you develop methods to look at all of these things? And in fact, Tannenbaum, and the, who's in the chemistry department, but also in the is looking at nitrosation of SHs, again, chromium reactive species, and he's developed new methods, sort of like Carol has, to try to specifically look at these modifications. And in the end, what you want to do, and this is the key, you might be able to detect this. The question is, is it interesting? And so you have to have a way to connect this back to the biology inside the cell, and that's what uh, the second paper is focused on. So, what we're doing today is simply looking at the technology that's been developed to try to uh, get a handle how do you look at whether you've got salt simulation, not really focusing on the biology of the consequences. And so, what we're using is mass spec, um, and we're using a method of mass spec. How many of you have done mass spec? Okay, so if you know something and I say something wrong, you should speak up because I'm not a mass spec expert. And um, actually, I got a whole bunch of information from, say, the Broad, and I thought it was not very good. So this is, we need, we need a way of trying to figure out that you're going to see there's hundreds of variations on the thing. I'm going to give you a very simplified overview of what things you need to think about. Um, and so um, if, if I say something that you don't agree with, tell me. Uh, OK, so we're looking at mass spec. This didn't exist when I was your age, using soft ionization methods. And what does that mean? It means um, that you don't want your molecule to crack. Okay. So the issue is that what mass spec is about, so we're going to be looking at mass spec, and the key issue of what you end up looking at is mass to charge. Okay. So M over Z. Okay. So the problem is, um, how do we get something charged enough so that the mass is small enough so that you can see it um, taking a look at the, the mass analyzer, which is going to be part of all mass spectrometers. OK. So one, there are two different ways you could um, change the mass to charge. You can dump an electron in. OK. And if you dump an electron in, that produces radical species, which can then fragment. OK, that's, we, we want to avoid that. That's not soft um, ionization methods. But how could, we, how could we control this? The way we can control this um, is dumping in protons. Um, and so what we could do is we can control it by adding protons or by subtracting protons. OK, and we'll see that. Um, different method, the different methods we're going to be looking at. We'll see there are two main methods that most of you have probably heard about in your classes. Um, one is electrospray ionization, so ESI. Um, and I think if you're in Brad's lab, they have a lot of these. Um, 
yesterday's class had people that um, that had used these but really didn't know much about what's inside the machine. So this is the kind of thing I think your generation, if you're going to use this as a tool, you need to roll up your sleeves and understand a lot more about what's going on. Um, and Maldi, and Maldi, Mazer, Maldi. Um, Matrix assisted laser desorption. It'll be come, come clear why it's called that in a minute. Okay, so these are the two methods, and um, what we do is we can protonate so that we can move this into the analyzer range where we can actually read it. So what we'll see is the analyzer, I'm going to show you sort of what the what the three parts of a mass spectrometer are, um, can only read 1,000 to 2,000 Daltons. Okay, so if you look at your protein, much, much bigger than that. So you're going to have to stick a lot of charges on there to be able to see anything. So that's um, the whole thing. And the question is, how do you do, do it by one method or by using um, the other method? Okay, so, so all mass specs have sort of the same components. So, and you can go to websites. The website, the Broad does have a website, and what the Broad will tell you is what all the spectrometers are, but I don't think they do a particularly good job telling you what's useful for what and why it's useful, which is, I think, what you need to use if you're only going to use it fleetingly and then move out. Um, so you have a source, so you have an inlet. How do you get your sample from the liquid phase or the solid phase into the gas phase? Okay, so that's going to be that. And so how, what is the distinct ionization method? Okay, and we will see that there are many ways that you can ionize, and we're just going to briefly look at um, in a cartoon overview of how this happens. And then, so once you ionize it, it needs to move from the source. Um, so you need to have um, ion movement into the analyzer. So this is the mast analyzer. Um, and this becomes important. And we will say there, are, we will see in a second that there are many methods to do the mass analysis, mass to charge analysis. And then after you do this, you have a detector. OK, and then furthermore, and I think this is a big part of it now, if you're doing whole cell anything, you have to have a really sophisticated method of data analysis. OK, and so that's the other thing that um, I get frustrated about all the time. So you see people, I mean, people do experiments where they, they've spent, uh, last year somebody spent three months trying to get all the proteins out of a cell, 10,000 proteins out of a cell by mass spectrometry, right? Now, because the technology is changing, they can do it in four days. Okay, but what do you do with this, all this information, and how do you use this information in a constructive way, and how do you know if it's correct or not? So those are the kinds of things I think if you're going to use this, I think everybody's going to be using this technology you need to educate yourself um, about how to look at this. OK, so that's what the issue is. And um, so we have a source, an analyzer, um, and a detector. OK, so, so this is just a cartoon of that, which describes this in more detail. And I think he put this on the web. I think he put the PowerPoint on the web. I was doing this in the last minute yesterday. Um, so it's different from the handout I gave you that's written out. This is a PowerPoint. OK, so you can go back and look at this. But um, one of the other things I wanted to say is that sometimes when you analyze um, your mass, you want to analyze it further. And that was true. That many, many of you might not have caught it, but that was true in the analysis that was carried out in this paper. Um, did anybody recognize that you had to analyze this by more, using more than one mass spec? Did you look at the data carefully enough? So also, you probably didn't read the supplementary information, which also is 
critical to think about. I mean, if you want to look at the methods, you need, you need to get in there and roll up your sleeves and look at them. So we're going to see that um, the methods that people often use is they don't look at the whole protein, but they degrade it down into pieces. So then you can find here a whole bunch of pieces. OK. But that doesn't tell you anything. Um, it, it, the mass does tell you something. It might tell you whether it's sulfenylated or that it hopefully can distinguish between any other modification. But it doesn't tell you the location of the sulfenylation. And so you can do a second math, method. So you can have um, some other gas. There are many ways to do this, that you bring this in. To now take a peptide, so you pick one mass charge, you throw in something that's going to degrade it by fragmentation. And then I'll show you in a minute, we understand what kind of, using certain methods, we understand the fragmentation patterns, which actually allow you to sequence the amino acids. And the reason I'm bringing that in is um, when I first got to MIT, Klaus Beeman was in the lab, and I did many experiments with him. Um, where, and these were the first experiments that were done to sequence peptides by mass spec as opposed to doing Edmund sequencing, um, which, you know, the mass spec was actually better. And there are pluses and minuses, but I noticed from looking at the, the literature, people are still using the same method um, that he developed. So, okay, so, so this is just the cartoon, um, and it just, shows you that there are many ionization methods. We're focusing on these two, FAB, fast atom bombardment. Um, that was, we didn't have any of these when I was your age. Um, fast atom bombardment um, is something I used a lot because I've worked on um, DNA drug interactions and it look, allows you to look at nucleic acids. Um, and a lot of these other methods don't. I mean, we're focused on proteomics in this particular paper. Um, and then mass analyzer. So you have time of flight. I think Brad's lab has mildly time of flight. So what does that mean? You got a long tube in here. Um, and what happens is you have mass to charge, and they have different sizes. And so the smaller ones fly faster. They don't, you want to keep them away from the walls, but the smaller ones fly faster than the bigger ones. Um, and so that helps you differentiate between all the ions um, you're actually looking at. Um, um, I guess somebody just told me you guys just got a new Ion trap, quadrupole ion trap. Anyhow, if you want to look at this, I have notes on all these things, but I think this is something you'd have to study in detail. And so while I have pictures of them all and how, they, how you can differentiate one from the other, I think it doesn't really mean that much to me because I don't know enough about the physics of how they were designed. I mean, this really has revolutionized what you can do. Um, OK, so that's the components of all mass spectrometers. What I want to do is very just briefly look at the ESI and then look at the MALDI um, and then show you what the issues are in general and then we'll focus right in on the paper. Um, and the, the recitation I did on Thursday, we didn't quite get through all of it. We got through most of it, but then we'll continue next week and also attach this to the biology, which is the second paper, the Nature Chemical Biology paper, also um, written by um, the Carroll group. Okay, so um, ESI, so that's the one we want to look at next, and so that's up there. This is a cartoon of how this works. Okay, so what do you do and how do you do this? Um, so the first thing is you have your protein of interest, which I'll call the analyte, and because we want to charge, lots of times you put it under acidic, more acidic conditions, pH 6 or something, 6.5, depends on the protein. So you get more charged states. And if you're trying to look at something big, you need a lot of charges on there to get it into this mass range of 1 to 2,000 to be able to um, see it using this method. And apparently what you do here, um, oh, can you see this? Have you, done, have you done this? So can you see this capillary? Can you look at what's going on? Oh, okay, I'm going to come over and look at Okay. So I was just wondering, because I haven't it's ever, off. yeah, so it's all closed off. It's yeah. in a box, and you, so you can't, there's not like a thing where you can watch what's going on. Not that I've seen. Okay, because I think it's sort of amazing, right? How do you get, how do you get this huge protein and solution into the gas phase, right? I mean, that to me is like mind boggling, okay? I mean, that, these guys were geniuses, that, that, and, and you know, there's been a number of Nobel Prizes for this, but I wouldn't have a clue how to do something like that. Um, so what you do is apparently you, 
um, you put it down a capillary and then you spray it out. Um, and then you have to, um, you get, so what you get at the end of this, this plume of spray, apparently you've got a lot of the analytes and a lot of solvent molecules. And then the goal is during this process to get into the analyzer is to get rid of, um, to separate all the analytes mixed together into a single analyte and remove all the solvent. Okay, so that's the goal. And apparently, according to the people that were here yesterday, this was taken from, I think, sort of one of the papers that was first out. This is the way they did it in the old days. I don't know if they still do it this way. Um, but the goal is really to get a single analyte with no solvent on it, okay? And so the question is, how do you do this? And um, the chamber they had was at atmospheric pressure. Um, and then they had a potential and pressure gradient, uh, which allowed um, it to get into the mass, before the mass analyzer. So you start here with the initial spray, and as you go farther, you remove some water molecules. You, you, you finally get to the place where you've removed enough water molecules that all these positively charged species come together. They're incredibly unhappy, and then they fragment apart. I mean, that's the way they describe it. It sounds reasonable. Um, and so you get smaller and smaller till eventually you get to a place where you have an analyte that you can look at specifically, um, and the water has been removed, and that's what you look at. Okay, so again, we need to be in the range of one to 2,000. So that's the way these things work, although I think, again, how you get to the looking at the single ions, I think, can differ in different mass spectrometers. And so um, what the issues are, I think, are shown here, and this, this is the beauty of this methodology. Um, so if you have a protein of 10,000 molecular weight, you couldn't see it uh, because a mass analyzer is, is limited. So you have to go all the way down to eight charges on it to be able to see it, okay? And then you divide that by that and you get, what do you have to, you have to do some corrections, but you get something that's um, this size Okay, but you can see it now because of all the charges on it. But the beauty is, if you add more charges, you get another peak. Okay, so, and you get another peak. And it all has the same information in it. It just differs uh, by the number of charge. So you have all this information. You can use the, all these informations together to give you a very accurate um, mass on this system. So this method, um, by analyzing all the data, and now the computers do this, I guess, routinely, um, can give you a very accurate um, mass. So if you look at this printout, um, it doesn't look like that. This is what it looks like, okay? And what do you think's going on there? So we look at mass charge, and we're in the range of 1,000 to 2,000 Daltons. And then what, what, what is this all of What is all of these peaks associated with? Anybody got a clue? Isotopes. Yeah, so isotopes. So where have we seen isotopes before? So these are mostly stable isotopes. We spent recitation two and three looking at radio isotopes. Okay, I would say you know, radioactivity is pretty important. Stable isotopes are extremely important to mass spectrometry. So if you get into this, you're going to be able, to, you'll, you'll see that being able to label things with different kinds of stable isotopes is key to really deconvoluting the complexity when you're looking at a whole proteome and thousands of peptides, okay? We're getting down, it becomes very complicated and you have to be able to um, compute what you ex expect based on the normal natural abundance isotopic distribution. So that's the key thing. So we no look at the normal isotopic distribution. Okay, and if you look at that, I think on the next, in the next one, I show you an example of that. So what are the isotopes? You probably can't read this here, but if you pull out your, your computer, you'll see this. So we have C12, C13, okay? We have hundreds of amino acids with carbons. So you have C12 and C13. Um, C12 is 99%, C13 is 1%. That's natural abundance, okay? So every one of these has different natural abundance. We know what they are, 
Um, and in fact, if you're an organic chemist, you can measure isotope effects using a mass spectrometer if you have something that's really accurate, which we do. I've measured a lot of C13 isotope effects using a mass spectrometer um, based on differences in natural abundance and changes. Yeah? The abundance of deuterium. The what? The natural abundance of deuterium. Yeah, I think it's up here. So it's up here. Um, I think it's, let's see, 3%. Yeah, protons, deuterium, 3%. Would you expect like, a huge distribution from that? See, you see isotope effects on everything. You see, if, if you do mass spec, I mean, this is something I think that's not appreciated, and you put, you, you put, you have a linker with deuteriums in it, and even if you chromatograph it, you change the chromatographic properties based on the deuterium. Um, and so you might think it's coming, migrating here, and it doesn't. It has an isotope effect on how it migrates. So yeah, you need to pay attention to all of this stuff, OK? And it seems like a small amount, but the beauty is that it, it is a small amount, but it's incredibly informative. And we have very powerful computers that it can allow us to do the analysis. So we do have protons. You see deuterium used. You saw deuterium used in this paper you read today. They did CD3 and CH3s, OK? Um, you can also see the tritium. OK, um, that's much smaller. I don't know what the ratio is, but you can look at it. But you also, this one is also incredibly important and is widely used in proteomics and 14 and 15. Um, and people do isotopic labeling, so they might feed N15 labeled lysine or arginine um, or deuterated lysine or arginine. And why do you think they would deuterate the lysine or the arginine or N15 label it? What do we know about lysine and arginine in terms of thinking about proteins, proteins and analysis of proteins? What do you think about lysine and arginine? You've seen it several times over the course of this semester, and you probably saw it in, in 507. The what? The protons will exchange. Well, no, because you put it, no. So that, that's true. If it was on a, hy a hydrogen on a nitrogen, it would exchange. But they put the deuteriums in on carbon, so they're not exchanging. OK, so but why that would happen in any amino acid, why lysine and arginine? And the reason is that almost all, and this was also done in this paper, you, you don't work on the huge protein. You, cl you cleave it into pieces. OK, and you cleave it into pieces with, where you cleave is with trypsin, which is the major You've seen this used now over and over again. That's a major thing you use because it cleaves next to basic amino acids. And so these become really important in labeling experiments. If you read much mass spec data, or if you look at Alice Ting's work, everything it, it is N15 um, and deuterium labeled in lysine and arginine to try to make sure they have coverage of the whole proteome, which is um, what her lab actually looks at. OK, so we have isotopic labels, and we can take advantage of these, and we can calculate what the distribution should look like, OK, of the isotope should be, depending on, you know, what the we know what the sequence is. We know what the abundance is. And so you can calculate the whole um, mass spec, OK? OK, so um, let's see. So there's going to be a number of things that we want to do. Um, and what we're going to be describing today and the next time is um, a workflow. These are the words that people use all the time. And a platform. Okay. And what we're trying to do um, in the case of the Carroll papers is simply look at whether the protein is modified or not. But as with most post-translational modifications, do you think this is going to be 100% modified? No. In fact, it's only partially modified. That adds to the complexity of understanding whether the biology is interesting or not. So what you have then is something that's modified and something that's mo non-modified. Okay. So then the question is, how do you tell how much is modified, how much is non-modified? If this enhances the rate only a factor of two, and this is 99.8% of this, are you ever going to be able to see an effect of this modification? That's the question 
that you have to focus on, and everybody and his brother is doing experiments like this. There are, we will see in a second, hundreds of post-translational modifications. Um, and the question is, what are they doing um, in terms of thinking about um, the biology of the system? Okay. So what's the platform? What did I do with my, oh, there it is. What's the platform we're going to use? So there are two ways you can look at this. So we have a protein that has been modified. Um, you're going to have, if you had a huge protein and you only had a single OH on it, even if it was 100% and the protein was, say, 300,000 molecular weight, you might not be able to see it. You need to do a calculation to see whether you could see it or not. If you have a small protein of molecular weight 30,000 or whatever, the, I think the 22,000 or 23,000, like glutathione peroxidase used in this paper, you could see it. So you could look at the protein directly. But how else could you do this? You would enrich. Um, you would want to, if you were doing this in the whole cell, you would want to separate this away from everything else. Okay, so to do that, you, you um, want to be able to have a way to stabilize this, okay, and that's what this paper is all about. And then not only to stabilize it, but to separate it, the stabilized form out. So um, where does this happen? Um, and in this particular cartoon, um, people, where do you see post-translational modifications? Probably the most popular one is phosphorylation. Okay, so we have signaling cascades and kinases. And in fact, if you look at the epidermal growth factor receptor, it's a tyrosine kinase, and it gets phosphorylated and is regulated. And this sulfenylation is supposed to be on top of the phosphorylation. So you have multiple post-translational modifications that can affect activity. So um, Forrest White, for example, in BE, works on kinase signaling cascades. Um, and so he's developed a method, has have others, to be able to pull phosphorylated proteins out of a crude gamish. Okay, so you know if you look at this here, here he's got iron um, bound to a phosphate and bound to some bead. Okay, so the iron's bound to some chelator on the bead, just like your nickel affinity column, which then um, binds to the protein. Um, but this raises the issue that I was discussing in class, which, which I've spent a lot of time on over and over again. But you need to think about, do you think these bonds are tight? How tight do you think those bonds are? What do you need to think about for this kind of analysis to work? It's the same thing with nickel affinity column with it, that you talked about when you were looking at purification of proteins. It has to be stable enough. That's the key. So you have to undergo ligand exchange. So it's got to, if, if you didn't have, when you start, you don't have phosphorylated form of your protein around. You have nothing. You have waters there. Okay. So the waters have to go undergo exchange. So the phosphate can then bind. But it's an equilibrium. And so up and down the column is coming off and on. Yeah. It could. I mean, so it's a question of what outcompetes what. It's a question of relative KDs. So what you have to do is study all of this to figure out how to optimize this. How did they arrive at this? Probably somebody did a lot of studies. Okay. Um, and this is a new method. I don't know how new it is, but it's a method that I don't know that much about. Again, of pulling phosphates out. So that's one way. Um, so you have. Um, so you usually have an affinity purification. And if we look at the Carroll paper, um, what she does in the next paper is she's going to figure out a way. She's derivatized. She's made a diamondone derivative, which stabilizes the sulfenic acid. And then she attaches something to it that's going to allow us to affinity purify that. We'll come back and talk about that later. So um, what, what are they using over here? They're using, this is if you look at um, histones that get acetylated or methylated. Um, they have an antibody that's specific for the acetylated lysine, so they use antibodies to pull something out. So that's a method. The second way of pulling things out are using antibodies. That's quite frequently used. And what did they use in this? What did they use in this paper to detect, detect the modified sulfenic acid? Does anybody remember? Did you read the paper carefully enough? Like an anti 
Yeah, right. so they use an anti-dimidone antibody. Okay, so that becomes really critical that you know that your antibodies are actually uh, working um, effectively. So we have antibodies, and then another thing that people are interested in in this department, the Imperiali lab, um, is sugars. We have sugars everywhere, okay? We don't really understand the function of these sugars. We understand some of them, but it's amazingly complex. Um, and what we have are proteins called lectins. Um, and any of you heard Laura Kiesling talk, maybe undergraduates wouldn't have done this, but she discovered a new lectin that specific, and discovered the basis, the structure of the sugar that binds to this lectin. And so you can selectively move that type of sugar. Again, it's an equilibrium, so they're coming off and on but it binds hopefully enough so that the other stuff washes through and you enrich um, in the protein of interest. Okay, so these are sort of some of the tricks um, that are actually used. We're gonna see in the case of the Carroll paper next time we use click chemistry um, to make something with a biotin on it because biotin, you all know, can bind to streptavidin, which has pluses and it has minuses, but it allows you to pull things out more easily because the interaction is so tight, okay. So um, you could do this. Uh, the workflow could be on the intact protein, or it could be on peptides. OK, and so the bottom half of, of this graph shows what happens after you treat this with trypsin. So with trypsin, you're always cleaving next to lysine or arginine. So if the C-terminus of your protein is always a lysine or an arginine. Um, and uh, you can find that more easily if you deuterate or N15 label it. That's what people routinely do in the brogue. Um, and then you have, I think this is the most amazing thing. So you have a protein, and then you have an HPLC column. Have any of you done HPLC? Um, and so do you think, you know, how much, you, know, you could have a protein of 300,000 molecular weight, and look at the separation of your peptides. So, but if you look at any one of these things, do you think it's pure? No, so it's not pure. So every one of these peaks, if it's 300,000 molecular weight, you can calculate. The reason people use trypsin is, does anybody know why you use trypsin? Besides that it cleaves at lysines and its specifics. Why do people use trypsin as a thing to cleave a big thing down into a little thing? No, so the rationale for cleaving it is just to make it smaller and easier to analyze. That, that's the rationale for cleaving it. So a peptide, a small peptide, but the question is how, how big is a small peptide that's easy to analyze? And so that's the rationale. It gives you a distribution of peptides that's pretty good that are all accessible to mass spec methods. Okay, so I don't know what the distribution is, but you, you know, people have done that calculation. And so almost always the peptides fly. Whereas if you use other things and you have something much bigger, it might not get ionized in the appropriate way or in a quantitative way and you completely miss, miss it. So the trypsin has been most successful, but each one of these little peaks is not one peak. It's, it's, you'll see when you put it into the mass analyzer, um, and if you read this paper carefully, you will see they got multiple mass charge species, which then they associated with specific peptides, okay? Um, they know the sequence of their protein. Um, and then they always use tosylphenylchloroketone. Um, why do they use that? Anybody have an, any idea? So in the experiments where they're doing the trypsin cleavage, they put in tosylphenylchloroketone. Anybody know why? Okay, not good. This is something that, um, so tosylphenylchloroketone um, is an alpha halo ketone, so it's activated for nucleophilic attack. Um, and what you do is you have an acylated N-terminus in an aromatic, and that's specific for chymotrypsin, like proteases. And so what this does is that covalently modifies the active site of trypsin, uh, chymotrypsin, and kills chymotrypsin. So you don't, if you, if you choose the wrong time to cleave with trypsin, you don't start getting cleavage next to hydrophobics, which then makes the analysis of the peptides much more complex. So the analysis of the peptide, a lot of people have done a lot of peptide chemistry. And I was telling this story before, I always go off on tangents, but Stein and Moore won the Nobel Prize. Like maybe this is what you do when you get old, but Stein and Moore got the, won the Nobel Prize um, 
you know, in the 1950s, the 1950s for separating amino acids. Do you know that they had a three-story column of Dowex that was composed of anion, exchange Dowex and cations, so it was all polystyrene backbones of anion and cation polystyrenes to be able to separate the amino acids, okay? And when you do that, of course, it gets stuck on the resin. Your, your recovery is out of the bottom of this chromatography. You need tons of stuff to put on the column in the first place. And this is what's happened. I mean, you have an HPLC, a little tiny HPLC column that has huge number of theoretical plates that allows you amazing separations. I mean, again, this, the technology is sort of mind-boggling um, what, what you can do now. Okay, so, so what you're doing here is then you're just asking the question, if you have a post-translational modification X, you can either look at the entire protein And so you could probably tell it was modified, but telling the location of the modified location you can't, or you can treat it with trypsin. Um, and then you get, again, with trypsin, you have little pieces. And one of these little pieces will have an X on it. Um, and then you can define it. And then if you want to do sophisticated analysis, you can hit it, use a second mass spectrometer, and actually um, sequence this. Okay. so. I think the next one just briefly goes to MALDI. Um, and MALDI, um, so matrix-assisted laser desorption. Have any of you ever done that? OK, so where do you, where do, you do that? You do that in Buckwall Lab? No, we did it in the undergrad lab. Oh, OK, because this is Brad's new thing. OK, so you're, oh, okay, so you're, looking, at pep, you're looking at peptides. OK, so, um, so what did you use as the matrix? Okay, so you probably used <laughs> senapenic acid. Alpha hydroxy senapenic. Okay, so this is so th you're using a different one still from this one. This is I don't I got this out of some of you. I don't know. So when I've done this, I did, did this maybe ten years ago. I've looked at a lot of peptides. Um, we had a, we went through five or six of them before we found one that really worked well. So I don't know. A state of the art has become you know what it is. Um, but the other one in, in the book that I got this from was, uh, again, an acid. And so what is the idea? So the first thing you have to do is you have to ionize. Okay, so um, the way you do that is you mix um, your matrix in solution with your protein of interest, your analyte. Then you evaporate it. So you have a solid on a little plate. And then you use a laser beam at 337 nanometers. Um, and the light is absorbed by whatever the matrix is and causes you to have a plume of material. This is, again, amazing to me that the protein um, goes into the gas phase. Um, and then you have to go through this and go into the analyzer. Um, lots of times you have, did you do time, do you do time of flight? And, okay, so you have time of flight, so you guys know what it is then. And then in the end, you do detection. So, again, the protocol is the same, but the method um, is different. And this is widely used and um, easy, really easy to use nowadays. Okay, so the issue then is this is what you face when you're looking at a whole proteome. So you just can't calculate the mass of all the proteins from the gene sequences. Why? Because almost every single amino acid in your proteins are modified. Okay, so that adds complexity to all of this. So deconvoluting the mass spec becomes more complicated. So this just shows you, you don't need to look at this, but if you look at cysteine, you can form disulfides. You can attach uh, a prenyl group, an isoprene group on it. You can attach palmitic acid on it. You can sulfenylate it. You can nitrosate it. So you have many, many modifications of the amino acids that are chemically reactive and involved on catalysis, and they're not only involved in catalysis, they're involved in regulation. So that then adds to the complexity of trying to deconvolute what the mass spec, um, I think, is actually telling you. Okay, and then what, sorry, I went backwards. And so then what that does is tells you, whoops, I'm, re all right, I'm just completely discombobulated here. Okay, so what that does is that, again, you're just adding different masses onto all of these amino acids. The problem is that you have modified and you have unmodified. So, and the question is, what's the distribution? Okay, and so if you have a very non-abundant protein, 
and most of it's unmodified, it's going to be much harder to find. So these are just things you need to think about. And your technology to look needs to be extremely well worked out so that when you look and you don't, something, you don't find something, you know what the lower limits of detection are. Um, OK, so here we are at our system. Um, and now we're into the Carroll paper. And so what we're looking at is sul sulfenic acids. Um, um, they're generated by hydrogen peroxide. Um, we'll see. Do you think that's a fast reaction, hydrogen peroxide with a cysteine? Anybody have any intuition? I think these reactive oxygen species you're going to find are not so intuitive about the chemical reactivity. I'll give you a table with what we think we know in general, but I think it's not so intuitive. Um, if you look at the rate constants for reaction of a hydrogen peroxide with a, with a cysteine, um, it's one per molar per second, really slow. OK, so then the question you have to ask yourself, so this was something that was debated in the literature for 15 years. Is this so slow that this could never happen inside the cell? Because I just gave you a second order rate constant, so we have two molecules interacting. The concentration, this could be high if this is really low. You can calculate the rate constant for the actual reaction. It's really, really slow. OK, so we'll see that there are some proteins, peroxyredoxins, that are in humans uh, um, and are there in quite high levels that can increase this rate to 10 to the fourth per molar per second. So there's a huge rate, rate increase. But you need to think about all this kinetic stuff to really understand if this modification can happen um, inside the cell. Otherwise, why, if it can't happen, why are you wasting your time looking for it, which is what a lot of people are doing science, scientifically. OK, so let me see what the next. OK, so now we're into um, making, making um, a, a reagent that can specifically modify this or specifically modify this. OK, so the reagent that they chose, she didn't invent this reagent, was dimidone. OK. OK, and this reagent specifically um, interacts with sulfenic acids. It doesn't react with the free cysteine. So you've got to study all of this. And if you're going to use this reagent inside the cell, you want it to be fast. You don't want it to take 30 hours to do the reaction. You want it to be over fast, and you want it to happen at pH 7. So how do you think this reaction works? Where's the most reactive part of this molecule? Yeah, so two protons. So this, these have low pKa's, so you can easily form the enolate. Depends on, on um, the details, the experimental details. And now you have this. And what you end up with is this molecule. And so the question is, does this go in 5% yield? You need something that goes in quantitative yield at pH 7 rapidly, OK? We're going to come back and talk about what the issues are, because the issues are even harder if you want this region to work inside the cell, OK? We're doing this on glutathione peroxidase, which is what she's using as a model to see if all of this stuff works. OK, so what you really want to do if you're thinking about regulation in the end is you want to know how much is in each form. And you know, if you read, there's hundreds of papers published on methods trying to figure this all out. But what she did in, in this case was looked at a second, she developed a second reagent with an iota group. OK. Um, and as you can see, what is the product of the reaction? The product of the reaction is the same as the product, um, as the product of this reagent. Um, but this reagent does not react with sulfenic acid. OK, so you get no reaction. So how does this reaction work? What do you think? The what? SN2. Yeah, so it could work by an SN2, but the way it probably works is it attacks the iodine. So you form, this is probably the mechanism from what's been done in the literature. So you attack this. And you form this. 
which then gets attacked by the enolate. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what the mechanism is, but the key thing is for this to react, if you're interested in mechanism, it, which I am, <laughs> it does matter um, what it is. But so the key thing is now you have the same reagent. So how could you ever use it attached? How could you ever use it to distinguish um, sulfenylation from a, a cysteine? So what did they do in this paper? Yeah, so they put the deuterated form on this. So what they did then was in, all, in this paper, so you've got to keep these straight. Um, if they see deuteriums present, so they made this deuterium label and this protonated. So now you have a mass difference of six, okay? And um, in the system, they use using glutathione peroxidase, which has three cysteines in it, and one of the cysteines is more reactive than the other two, but for proof of concept, they mutated two of these cysteines into serine, so you only had a, initially, so you only had a single reactive cysteine, but then they went back and studied um, the whole protein. Okay, so um, let me just introduce you to this, and then we'll come back and talk about this um, ne next time. Let me just do one more thing. Okay, so here is the difference in mass between these two um, species, so this is what you're looking at. This, if they start out with um, deuterium labeled diamidone, um, the peak that they observe is going to be associated with sulfenylation. And if they start out with the protonated material, the peak they observe is going to be associated with the, the sulpiter group. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, and then what they did was they simply took their protein, um, and they have, in this case, 50 micromolar of their protein, um, and then they increase the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. They don't really talk very much about how they design the timing, uh, but they use, you know, two equivalents. So they use variable amounts of hydrogen peroxide. Um, and what you can see um, is the maximum amount. So now what you're using, we talked about this before, but we're using anti-dimidone antibodies for the detection. Um, and um, here they're starting with no hydrogen peroxide, so you don't see any dimidome derivative, and then you increase the concentration, um, but you get to the highest concentration here um, that they looked at. So it's 100 micromolar versus 50 micromolar in the, of protein they used. Um, but what did this immediately tell you? Did any of you look at this data very carefully? So what is this, this guy here? is associated with a sulfide group that is only reacted with iododimidone. So if you've got 100% yield, what does that tell you? This tells you the maximum amount of material you're going to observe. So if you look at this peak and you look at that peak, you can't do this by eyeball. You need to do this quantitatively. We have instrument, the phosphor images or methods that allow us to do this quantitative. What do, what do you see? It's not at the max. Yeah, it's not at the max. And so what we'll do next time. So and. So these are sort of controls, and the question is, how effective is this reagent? Um, and if you start hanging stuff off of your dimidone over here, are you going to change the rate of modification? Can it get into the active site where this SOH actually is? These are the kinds of things we're going to talk about next time when we look a little bit more at the details of, of the reaction with this. And you should look at the reaction with um, gap dehydrogenase, which is another control um, enzyme they ended up looking at. Because it tells what they do is address what the issues are that you're going to encounter when you get into something real that you care about, and that's much more complicated. Okay, so that's it. <laughs>